Last week we started a series called The Spirit of the Age, and uh, today we're going to continue with that series. And let me begin today by, by giving a, a bit of advice to parents. If you are a parent of an elementary age child and they're in the room, just want to give you a heads up that we're going to be talking openly about the events of the day, the current events. Those are things that are happening in the news. And uh, so if you're comfortable with your elementary age child being part of that discussion, you are welcome to uh, keep them here. If not, you might want to take advantage of our Kids of Grace uh, elementary age ministry upstairs. First John chapter 4, verse 1, if you're there, say amen. amen. If not, look on the screen. It says, dear friends, aren't you glad we get to be friends? Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of who? Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And they are from the world, therefore they speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth in the spirit of falsehood. Now, in this series, we are making a couple of preliminary points about the Antichrist. First of all, the Antichrist will be a man uh, who will be revealed after the rapture, but he's also a spirit. Antichrist is a spirit. As a matter of fact, John says here in 1 John 4, the Antichrist was in the world. The spirit of Antichrist was in the world even 2,000 years ago. Okay. Now, I, I heard a, about a discussion at the ladies' Bible study this last week that was pretty, pretty uh, it was a new thought to me, was the fact that the devil does, ne, doesn't know when the rapture is going to take place. So he doesn't, how does he know to have the Antichrist ready? Well, the, the, the teacher of that Bible study was making a thought, making a presentation that he has had many Antichrists ready. Yeah. Oh, wow, that explains a lot, doesn't it? But Because he doesn't know when the rapture is going to take place. But the spirit of Antichrist has been alive. Uh, all, it's a spirit and a man. Number two, as we get closer to the return of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist will grow. It will become more prevalent. It will become more dominant. And that's why we're talking about this here today. But the third thing, and this is the most important part, as followers of Jesus, how do we respond to the Antichrist? To overcome the spirit of the age, we act in the opposite spirit. Everybody say opposite. So whatever the spirit of the age is, we act in the opposite spirit. That's how you win spiritual warfare. Are you hearing me? If the devil is coming at you, if you feel like you're in a fight and it's intimidation, you respond with humility, right? If people are yelling at you, the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. This works in every relationship. This works in every situation, opposite spirit. Okay. And so we are addressing these topics. Last week we addressed violence and fear. And how many know the opposite of violence is peace and the opposite of fear is faith, right? Somebody sent me this uh, note from last week I want to share with you. It said, hey, Pastor Wayne, just wanted to tell you that last week's message completely changed my view of this world and my dreams and that I need to be more in the spirit of God, living more in the spirit of God than ever. Chains of fear and anger and vengeance were completely broken and taken from me by the Holy Spirit. And my heart has a new mission, which is to spread love and truth. I don't have to live in fear or in a sense of depression from the media because I live in the promises of the Father. Would you give God praise for that today? Amen. That's the goal. That's the goal is for us not to live in the spirit of the age, but to live in the opposite spirit, the spirit of God. And at the end of today's service, we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to help us to live in the opposite spirit because today's topic is intolerance and deception. Next week, we're going to talk about lawlessness and antichrist. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to, I've got so much stuff to share. I'm going to speak fast. You listen fast. Is that all right? Is that a deal? Well, I'm not going to go any faster that you can't understand me, but let's, let's talk about this. The spirit of the age is a spirit of deception. The spirit of the age is a spirit of deception. Verse, uh, in, the, in the verse that we read, uh, 
Beginning here in 1 John, it says, do not believe every spirit. Now, why should we not believe every spirit? Because the scripture says many false prophets have gone out into the world. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So let's be clear. The Bible says in the last days, one of the things that's going to happen is people will be deceived. People will believe stupid stuff, right? And, Paul, and Paul's pretty blunt here. He says, they're going to believe things taught by demons. And, and we're going to be amazed at the stupid stuff that people believe and how they kind of throw away common sense and just grab on to things that are just, can I just go ahead and say it, insane. How many know this is happening already? Did you know more people believe in aliens than believe in God, according to a recent survey in the United Kingdom? More than 33 million UK citizens believe in extraterrestrial life compared to just over 27 million who believe in God. By the way, the world's smartest man, Stephen Hawking, believes in aliens. He says, to my mathematical brain, the numbers alone make thinking about aliens perfectly rational. The real challenge is to figure out what they might actually look like. Now, this is coming from the world's smartest man. How many know Romans 1.22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. World War Z is not science fiction to many Americans. 14% of Americans believe there's at least a small chance of a zombie apocalypse. (laughs) The older folks are laughing. The younger folks are like, it might happen. (laughs) Put away the video games. Welcome back to reality. Come on, somebody. All right. Listen, more people know the details about Homer Simpson than American history. A study by the New McCormick Tribune Freedom Museum found that 22% of Americans could name all five Simpson family members compared with just one in 1,000 who could name all five First Amendment freedoms. Our culture has been drinking heavy doses of stupid sauce for a while now. Matter of fact, we may have gone on a binge. And it's starting to have a huge impact on our culture. It's starting to have a huge impact on us. In 2003, the Strategic Task Force on Education investigated Americans' knowledge of world affairs. How much do you know about what's going on in the world? The task force concluded, listen to this, America's ignorance of the outside world is so great as to constitute a threat to national security. How do we know that we are deceived? We believe a man can be a woman. A woman can be a man. You can be whatever gender you choose to be. Bruce Jenner comes out this week on television telling everyone that he is now a woman. And he's applauded for his choice of coming out. We actually have a term in our vocabulary now called same-sex marriage. The very term is an oxymoron. Yesterday, I did a wedding uh, for a couple in our church, and for the first time ever on the marriage license, it no longer says bride and groom. It says applicant one, applicant two. I'm like, who's number one? Who's number two? That doesn't seem right. That's not fair. In our culture, you have to get your parents' permission to go on a field trip or take aspirin at school, but not to get an abortion. An 80-year-old woman can be strip-searched by TSA at an airport, but a woman in a hijab is only subject to having her neck and head searched due to religious objections. A 7-year-old boy can be kicked out of grade school for saying his teacher was cute, But hosting a sexual exploration of diversity class in grade school is perfectly acceptable. You have to show ID to board a plane, cash a check, check out a library book, but not to vote on who runs the government. We are deceived. Stupid sauce. 
It's called political correctness. What's going on? What, what, what's happening? Can I, can I, I'm just going to speak clearly today. Is that all right? We are being conditioned. We are being prepared for the man of sin to come onto the world who will deceive many, many people. That's what the scripture says. And I think this whole idea of political correctness is, is illustrated in an article I read recently about Rob Bell, who's a former pastor of a very large church in Michigan. He is now on Oprah's network. And uh, he, on his show, he says, Christianity is irrelevant if it continues quoting the Bible. Let me, let me quote him, okay? Rob Bell, former megachurch pastor turned spiritual advisor to Oprah Winfrey, said that the culture is ready to embrace homosexuality and same-sex marriage, and if the church hopes to stay relevant, it must accept those relationships and stop looking to the Bible as its best defense. Bell was recently asked by Winfrey on her network show, Super Soul Sunday, how close Christian churches are to accepting homosexuality. Bell said they are close and warned if they don't, they will become even more irrelevant than before. Here's what he said. I think culture is already there. And the church will continue to be more, even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. When you have in front of you flesh and blood people who are your brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and co-workers and neighbors, and they love each other and just want to go through life with someone. Winfrey replied, you sound really progressive to me. So Bell's wife, Kristen, chimes in to know that while some churches are moving forward to embrace same-sex relationships, others are regressing and digging their heels in. And this is why... We are ready for Antichrist. This is why we are ready for, uh, for deception to come upon us, because here's why. Because we have no standard of truth. We have no standard of what is right and what is wrong. We have become the measure of ourselves. It's whatever I think. It's whatever I say. Whatever feels good. Whatever's popular. Come on, somebody. Right? Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 describes this in verse 11. God shall send them strong delusion. Let me know that is the culture we live in. We live in a culture of strong delusion. Uh, I would say God shall send them stupid sauce, but that's another thing. They should, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. There is a cost for rejecting the truth. There is a cost for ignoring this book. It's a high cost, the scripture says. 2 Timothy 3, in the last days, difficult days will come. Men will be led by their impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I think Paul's prophecy is spot on right there, don't you? Because we live in the information age. We have more information at our fingertips than ever before, than any other generation before us. So why in the world are we so stupid? The Bible says it's because we can't grasp the truth. We've got all kinds of information, but we don't have truth. We have all kinds of knowledge, but we lack the truth. And how I many know without truth, knowledge is meaningless? Without truth, knowledge is it, it, it's not going to help us. Now listen, the Bible says Antichrist, the man, will be a deceiver. In Revelation 13, verse 14, the Bible says, He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do. So, Antichrist will come on the scene, and the Bible says he will be a liar. 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So I want you to notice what the scripture says. Antichrist, deceiver, same thing. Okay? 2 Thessalonians 2, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the Bible says that the man of sin, the son of perdition, all names for the Antichrist, when he's revealed, that many will be deceived. He will come on the scene, the scripture says, as a man of peace. He will come on the scene as a peace broker. And a lot of Bible scholars believe that he's going to broker a peace treaty with Israel and her enemies. How many know Israel has some enemies? Okay. Israel enemies are, Israel's enemies are very active. 
That's one of the main reasons we're trying to keep Iran from getting a nuclear bomb, because they have sworn they will destroy Israel. Now, if you're paying attention, you know this is right now. This is going on right now. And so, but the Bible says the man of sin will come on. He'll be a very charismatic leader. And the Bible says he's going to perform signs and wonders. He will blow people away. And because we have been conditioned to believe things that are not true, the Bible says the whole world will go after him. But remember, I'm going to quote, I'm gonna, uh, remember who he is. And I'm going to quote one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride. <laughs> Liar! Liar! Anybody know what I'm talking about? Can I get a witness in that? I'm, I'm speaking truth today. That old lady walks out, liar! You know, she calls me a liar. That's who the, that's who the Antichrist will be, all right? That's the only uh, humorous break in this entire message. So here we go. Matthew 24. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. One of the most sobering scriptures in the entire Bible. Please listen. Please pay, it, pay attention. The Bible says that this man will be so full of deceit, so full of guile, with such an ability to, uh, to convince people that, that wrong things are, are true, that even the elect, some of them will be deceived. Some of them will believe him. So you say, Pastor, I'll never believe that. I'll never do that. No, no, no. This is why we're talking about this. We've got to pay attention, right? So how do we overcome the spirit of deception? I could spend hours just talking about examples of this, but how do we overcome it? How do we combat it? Well, we know that it, to overcome the spirit of the age, we have to act in the opposite spirit. So what is the opposite spirit of deception? Anybody know? It's truth. The opposite of deception is truth. So we, instead of operating in a spirit of deception, we operate in a spirit of truth. Now, pastor, what does that mean? What is truth? It's very easy. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, your word is truth. Are you getting this? Your word is truth. So this is our manual. This is our guide. This is our truth. So we don't operate in the thinking patterns of the world. We don't say, oh, this was 2,000 years ago that it no longer matters to us. It's out of date. No, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. The Bible says that these words will last forever. The Bible says that flowers will fade and grass will wither away, but the word of the Lord will be established forever. Come on, somebody. This word is the truth. Psalm 33, the word of the Lord is right, and his works are done in truth. The word of the Lord is right, and his works are done in truth. I don't care if it's 50 AD, or 1500 AD, or 2015 AD, or, or God help us if we make it to 2050 AD, the word of the Lord will be right, the word of the Lord will be true, this word will last forever, amen. So... How do we overcome? We need to love the truth. We need to know the truth. And we need to speak the truth. Right? If we're going to overcome deception, and here's the good news, we can. We absolutely can. We don't have to be afraid of this. We should be, we should be serious about this. But we can overcome. Your kids can overcome. Your students can overcome. But you got to know the truth. You got to study the truth. You got to love the truth. And here's the reality that's not what we're doing. In an article titled The Crisis of Biblical Literacy, uh, theologian Michael Viak says the nine most important issues facing the evangelical church. He cites biblical illiteracy in the church as his number one concern. He agrees with George Barna's assessment that the Christian body in America is immersed in a crisis of biblical illiteracy. Wheaton College professor Timothy Larson said, it's been demonstrated that biblical, illiteracy has con uh, biblical literacy has continued to decline. Gallup polls have tracked this descent to a current record low. Translation, we know less about the Bible than ever before. 
Biblical illiteracy is at a record low. Study after study in the last quarter century has revealed that American Christians increasingly don't read their Bibles, don't engage their Bibles, don't know their Bibles. It's obvious. We are living in a post-biblical literate culture. Just as critical is the second word of the Bible literacy problem, just literacy. Watch this. Pew Research tells us that 23% of us didn't read a single book in the last year. That's three times the number who didn't read a book in 1978. So whether it's the internet, video games, television, or increased time spent on entertainment and sports, Americans are spending less time between the the pages of any book, not just the good book. And because of that, we are ripe for deception. So how do we overcome this incredible time of deception? Now watch this. The Bible says that God will send strong delusion. That people will believe a lies. Can I challenge you? Make a commitment to this book. You and your family, put this book in the center of your life, in the center of your home, in the center of your schedule. This is the antidote to stupid sauce. <laughs> I, I don't know where that term came from. It just came to me this week as I was putting this down. I'm like, that must be the Lord. You know, I asked the other pastor, stupid sauce, where's that come from? I think it refers to hot sauce, stupid hot. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm stupid sauce. You know, this is it. Parents, I'm going to challenge you. You make sure your kids know this book. This is your primary calling, parents, to make sure your kids know this book. Read it. Talk about it. Meditate on it. Pray through it. Come on, somebody. Listen. You say, oh, I'm so afraid of my kids, I'm afraid of my kids. No, give them the book. Teach them to love the book. If it's junior Bible quiz, teen Bible quiz, whatever program, do something, right, to teach them this book. And for all of us, let's stop sharing our opinions and let's, stop, let's start speaking the word of the Lord, amen? Let's start speaking, this is what God says, this is what God's word says, and it will last forever. By the way, uh, we're going to devote the entire summer uh, to dealing with this issue of biblical illiteracy, and we're, go- we're going to call what we're doing the Big Ten, and we're going to take Bible stories uh, from, from, the, from the word of God, Bible stories, stuff you learn in Sunday school, except We're not going to Sunday school. And so we're just going to use simple Bible stories to proclaim powerful truths. It's going to be an awesome summer. Somebody say amen. Amen. So you overcome the spirit of deception by the spirit of truth. Here's the second thing. The spirit of the age is the spirit of intolerance. And these two kind of go together. Deception and intolerance. How many know uh, intolerance or the subject, subject of tolerance really deserves its own sermon? Matter of fact, it deserves its own series. I've got a file growing by the day just dealing with this issue of tolerance or intolerance. And so I apologize for the amount of information I'm about to try to cram into your brain. But I've been holding on to this for some time. Now, tolerance is the idea that all belief systems are valid, right? All are equal. None is above the other. Truth is relative. It's, it's, it's really political correctness, right? You know, it's kind of, people, when they talk about tolerance or political correctness, they say things like, you know what, you ought not to judge. I mean, have you ever heard anybody say that? You shouldn't judge. Well, my response to that is, then why are you judging me for judging? (laughs) Isn't that a judgmental statement? Don't judge. That's judgmental of you. Okay. Uh, How how many know that's a self-defeating statement? This goes with stupid sauce, by the way. It's a self-defeating statement. Statements like, I can't, I can't speak a word in English. <laughs> I'm giving you time. A self-defeating statement is like, my brother is an only child. <laughs> my parents had no kids that lived. <laughs> and you may have to think about this one. Everything I say is a lie. Come back tomorrow and you say, I've been thinking about that one. (laughs) Here's the deal. This type of thinking is self-defeating. Relativism is self-defeating. Because when people say to you, there are no absolute truths, our response is, are you absolutely sure? (laughs) All truth is relative. Don't you know? Come on, get with the times. All truth is relative. Isn't that a relative truth? Right? Uh, And if it's true that there is no truth, then the statement there is no truth can't be true because it can't be true. (laughs) It doesn't even meet its own standard. It's self defeating, it's illogical. Stupid. (laughs) 
I'm sorry for twisting your brain around so early in the morning. <laughs> now listen, to our culture, there is not a more non-PC statement than this verse from John 14. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is no more intolerant statement in the entire Bible than that. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, we read it. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. So watch this. Political correctness is by definition the spirit of Antichrist. I'm giving you time. The scripture says every spirit that does not recognize Jesus as the Christ is antichrist. The political correctness, the spirit of the age says no one person can say that they are God. No one says that there's, there's only one way. Well, Jesus said that. So to oppose that is antichrist. So let me be clear. Political correctness is the spirit of antichrist. Every spirit, verse 3, every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is the spirit of Antichrist. First John 2, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son, right? So listen, but the word tolerance, a definition from dictionary.com, the word tolerance says a fair, objective, and permissive attitude toward opinions, beliefs, and practices that differ from one's own. So we are taught, quote, unquote, that we are supposed to be tolerant of other people. And we're supposed to tolerate other people's opinions, beliefs, and practices that differ from our own. So the the challenge is, what is defined as tolerance in our current culture is actually intolerance. Because the definition that I just read is not what people are practicing. What they are practicing is intolerance. Those who preach tolerance and diversity are the least tolerant and the least diverse of all people. They are hypocrites. In the spirit of the age, if you disagree with the politically correct culture, not only are you wrong, you are an imbecile, an idiot, a racist, a homophobe, a hater, or fill in swear word here. The spirit of the age leaves no room for discussion. The spirit of the age leaves no room for for civility, no no reason, no debate. This is not tolerance. This is a spirit of intolerance. And we are handing over the freedoms that millions of people died to give to you and me in the name of political correctness. And that bothers me. That stirs me up. It's wrong. You may have read about the story of Robert Smith, a student at Dartmouth College in 2012. One of his fellow students hated his campus pro-life display so much that he actually ran over it with his car right in front of the student organizers. On the car, though, there was this bumper sticker that supposedly is to promote tolerance and respect to all belief systems. That one. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Let's coexist while I run over you. That's the spirit of the age. Author Timothy Keller put it this way, tolerance isn't about not having beliefs. It's about how your beliefs lead you to treat people who disagree with you. How are those who are pushing so hard for equality treating those who disagree with them? That's a fair question. Is there civil debate? Is there rational discussion? Absolutely not. If you disagree, you're threatened. We'll burn down your pizza place based on a hypothetical question. We'll we'll institute boycotts, intimidations, and threats. Now, let me pause for a second and and let you in on something. You need to know that most of the folks in our state government are bivocational. They have jobs other than the state house. Other than uh, than those things, they have businesses, they have places where they work. And many of the ones that voted for RIFRA and the amendment to the state constitution last year defining marriage between a man and a woman, did you know they were threatened? Their businesses were threatened. Some of them were physically threatened. 
This, this is not democracy, people. This is not tolerance. This is a spirit of intolerance that wants nothing to do with debate or open discussion or civility or knowledge. Come on, somebody. Rick Warren put it this way. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first half, the first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. That is so good. We think if you disagree with me that I hate you. That is crazy. That stupid song. What we're seeing is the spirit of the age growing making way for Antichrist because you need to know that Antichrist will be an intolerant dictator. Second Thessalonians 2, let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. That's not all faith are equal. That's, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. That's the Antichrist saying, I'm God. Revelation 13 says, he ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast and caused all who refused to worship the image to be killed. That's not very tolerant. Is it? Worship me or die. Believe what I believe or be killed. Do what I say or else. That is the spirit of Antichrist. That is the spirit of intolerance. Antichrist will be a ruthless, maniacal, Satan-possessed dictator who will put Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, and every other evil leader in history to shame compared to the evil he will perpetrate on the world. But let me be clear. Antichrist, this is my opinion, Antichrist will use political correctness to gain power. And when he gains power, he will be the worst tyrant in all of history. Because the spirit of intolerance is vicious. It's attacking. It's accusatory. It's a slandering spirit. Anyone who stands up to this spirit will be on the receiving end of lies, untruths, vitriol, and personal attacks. We're seeing this happen in our, in our culture, right? So what do we do in response? <laughs> we give it back to him, Pastor. We just we form a militia. We 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 just give it. no. This is where it's going to get quiet. All right, because some people are like, yeah, where's the rally? No, I don't want to point you to a rally. I want to point you to an altar. Watch this, because we have allowed the spirit of the age to become part of us, and because the way you overcome this spirit is not you don't fight fire with fire. You know, that's not in the Bible, but this one is. You don't overcome evil with evil. You overcome evil with good. So the opposite of the spirit of the age, the spirit of intolerance, the opposite spirit is the spirit of love. And that is how we overcome the spirit of intolerance, is love. Don't shout me down. 1 Peter chapter 3, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. The Bible says, speak up. Whatever you do, speak up. Speak the truth. Come on. Share the truth of God's word. Don't be quiet. Don't be silent. Don't put your head in the ground. Don't, don't sit in the corner and let everybody, don't let the evil spirit of this world take over and destroy everything. Don't do it. But when you do speak up, and when you do lift your voice, do it with gentleness. Do it, do it with respect. Don't match their spirit. Are you hearing me? You act in the opposite spirit, which is a spirit of gentleness and respect, Peter says. And by the way, Peter writes this as Nero and the Romans are literally crucifying Christians. Wow. So he says, keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Amen. Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. There's a different perspective. 
Blessed are you when people persecute you, when people slander you, when people say all kinds of lies against you because of me. That's a good sign, the scripture is saying, that you are acting in the opposite spirit. Corey Ten Boom wrote a book called Reflections of God's Glory. She says, in Africa, a man came to a gospel meeting with bandaged hands. I asked him how he had been injured. He said, my neighbor's straw roof was on fire. I helped him to put it out, and that's how my hands were burned. Later, I heard the whole story. The neighbor hated him and had set his roof on fire while his wife and children were asleep in the hut, and they were in great danger. Fortunately, he was able to put out the fire in his house on time. But sparks flew over to the roof of the man who had set the house on fire, and his house started to burn. Now, pause for a second if you said, if you're in your, um, under your breath saying, good. Because that's not the Spirit of God. She says, there was no hate in the heart of this Christian. There was love for his enemy, and he did everything he could to put out the fire in his neighbor's house. And that how, is how his own hands were burned. Here's what Booker T. Washington said. I let no man drag me down so low as to make me hate him. And I think he may know a few things about being treated badly. Church, this is a serious challenge. This is a serious time for all of us. Because, let me just say this again, in our own power, we can't do this. This is impossible. The way that we overcome the spirit of the age is we act in the opposite of the spirit of the age. We act in love. That's not normal. And it doesn't come natural. So we have to do what? We have to be filled with the spirit of God. Instead of just drinking from the spirit of the age, the stupid sauce, the violent stuff, the fearful stuff, the, you know, for culture, 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 we need to stop drinking from that well and go drink from the well of living water where Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Paul said, be filled with the spirit. I'm going to close with some good news and we're going to pray. Are you ready for some good news? Hey, Amen, pastor. Here we go. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I want you to look at that scripture. God wants to deliver us from this present evil age age. Oh, I take a lot of hope in that. I take a lot of courage in that. Uh, that. That puts a smile on my face when I realize that God's plan is to deliver us from this present evil age. We look around, we say, is the age that we live in, is it evil? Absolutely. Is it filled with darkness? Absolutely. Is it full of fear? Yes. Is it growing in violence? Yes. Is there deception all around? Yes, there is. Is there, is there intolerance and hatred and anger toward people who are f uh, of the faith? And the answer is yes. And so, but the Bible says, but God's plan is to deliver us from this present evil age. Anybody want to be delivered from the present evil age that we live in? Anybody want to overcome the spirit of the age? And instead of acting in the same spirit of the world, we act in the spirit of God. Is that anybody? If that's you, would you stand all over this room here today as a response? And as you're standing, I want you to begin to pray for yourself. I want you to begin to pray for yourself as you're standing. Because surely the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you, speaking to your heart. Perhaps he is convicting you of 
your reaction to the events of the world, your reaction to the way things are going down. So I'm going to give you a few moments. We're going to sing this song, this chorus here for just a moment. And I'm just going to give you an opportunity right where you're standing to talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Just say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me if there's any part of my life that I have been given over to deception. Any part of my life where I have succumbed to the spirit of the age and intolerance, hatred, anger, vitriol, slander. Instead of hating people, Holy Spirit, I need to love people. Just ask the Holy Spirit, search your heart. Make, it, make an altar right where you're at, right where you're standing. Would you talk to Jesus? Everybody, I'm asking everybody. If you're watching online, make an altar right where you're at. Talk to Jesus. Holy Spirit, search me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, show me my life and my heart. I'm going to give you a few moments as we sing this song. talked about overcoming the spirit of deception would you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed how many are here and would say you know what pastor the spirit of God is convicting me about my commitment to the word of God my schedule my priority and I need to make the word of God a greater priority in my life studying the word of God knowing the word of God loving the word of God heads are bowed eyes are closed but if that's you here today and you say, you know what, Pastor, that's me. And with God's grace, I'm going to make a greater commitment in my schedule, in my life, in my family, in my home, a greater priority to the Word of God. I'm raising my hand. Is anybody to raise your hand with me? I want you to make that your prayer to the Lord. Holy Spirit, give me a new hunger for the Word of God. Give me a new hunger for truth, a new passion for the words of life. God, you want to deliver us from the spirit of the age. And part of the way that you're going to do that is to help us to know the truth. God, we don't want to just have information. God, we want to know truth. We want to base our lives on the things that will last forever. Come on, ask the Holy Spirit. God, show me where to, how to make this happen. Show me, Holy Spirit. Give me a strategy for, for making this a priority, a time every day, a place every day, a plan of knowing your word, a Bible study. God, an opportunity to help us, oh God. Help us, O oh God, to read your word, to learn your word, to speak your word, to love your word, O oh God. Forgive us, we pray, for neglecting your truth, God, for being biblically illiterate. Forgive us, God, we pray, for neglecting the very thing that can save us. And Father, we pray there'll be a revival in our hearts concerning the word of God. Let there be a revival in our homes concerning our commitment to God's word. Let there be a revival, Lord, in our own personal lives of loving and living and speaking the words of Jesus Christ. Amen. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. If you're here this morning and the Spirit of God is convicting you and challenging you when it comes to this issue of intolerance, that, you know, far too often our reaction is anger. Our reaction is, is we want to give back what has been given to us. We want to, we just want to give, we just want to return in the same spirit and, and the spirit of God is speaking to you and convicting you and, and you just raise your hand to heaven and say, God, I'm sorry. If that's you, raise your hand to heaven. God, I'm sorry. God, replace this junk in my heart with the spirit of God. Replace this, these feelings, this anger, 
God, and, and, and if it's not righteous indignation, God, I pray you'd remove it from me. I pray you remove it from my heart. I pray you remove it from my vocabulary, from my words, oh God. And God, replace it with a spirit of love. Replace it, oh God, with a spirit of grace, with gentleness and respect, with reverence, Lord. In a world filled with anger and vitriol, God, may we be seasoned with grace and boldness and courage, but with love. Baptize us with love, we pray. Come on, make that your prayer. God, baptize us anew with your love. Give us a new love, oh God. Give us a new love for our neighbors. Give us a new love for our coworkers, God. Give us a new love for our leaders. Give us a new love, oh God, for those we go to school with. Give us a new love, Lord Jesus, for those that, that we interact with on a regular basis. God, instead of looking at people as the enemy, God, help us to look at them through your lens as people who are lost, who need Jesus Christ, people who are hopeless. God, forgive us for giving in to fear. Forgive us for giving in to hate, God, and give us a new love. Give us a new grace for those around us. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I want you to look at me here this morning because I sense very strongly in my spirit that what God is wanting to do in his church and in us is to be filled with the Spirit. What, what's the answer? What's the solution? What, what's God going to do about this, Pastor? God's already got a plan. Plan's already in motion. Be filled with the Spirit. And that Spirit will overcome the Spirit of the age. That spirit will deliver you from this present evil age. So I'm going to open these altars for anybody who would say, I want to be filled with the spirit of God. I want to have more of the spirit of God in my life than I have right now. And unless you were on your way to church today and your shadow fell, fell on the side of somebody and healed them, or you were loaning out your handkerchiefs because you, your sweat that you had, you know, you loaned it out so people could take it to a miracle service and pray for folks to be healed. You probably need more of the spirit of God like me. Amen? And so I'm going to open these altars. We're not going to have a formal dismissal here today. But I, if you're here and you say, I want more of the Spirit of God. I want to be filled with the Spirit. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want to pray for you here today that you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If, if, if you need more of God than you have right now, I want to invite you to come now. Come on, come now and let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. Let's seek God. Let's press in. God, fill me, empower me, anoint me, baptize me, strengthen me, God with the spirit of heaven the Bible says if we seek him we'll find him the Bible says in the last days he's gonna pour out his spirit on all flesh sons and daughters old men dreaming dreams having visions oh God do it we pray open up the heavens oh God open up the heavens oh God open up the heavens over this place over my life over my house over my family in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus, fill me, God. Fill me, oh God. Fill me, oh God. Fill me.